Welcome back. I'm Melissa Harris Perry, and it has been one week since a group of armed protesters started their occupation of a federal government building on a wildlife refuge in Oregon. The group is led by Eamon and Ryan Bundy, the sons of Clive and Bundy, who you may remember from 2014 in Nevada, where he led his own armed opposition against the federal government in Nevada over a beef, you know, about cows and land. This time around, the Bundy brothers picked up where their father left off, launching their standoff on a similar claim against the ownership and management of public lands by the federal government. The protesters were initially part of a rally in support of Dwight and Stephen Hammond, an Oregon rancher and his son convicted of arson in 2012. The elder Hammond received a three-month sentence. The son received a year and a day. Federal prosecutors appealed the sentences and convinced the judge to abide by the five-year mandatory minimum for burning federal property. Monday, the Hammonds surrendered and began serving out the remainder of their sentences. After the initial rally, a group of men traveled 60 miles to Oregon's Mallard National Wildlife Refuge where, according to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, they broke into an unoccupied building and vowed to remain there indefinitely calling for the release of the Hammonds and recognition of what they say is a government war on ranchers. Friday, Eamon Bundy and his group tried to make their case to the local sheriff. Who was more interested in bringing resolution to the siege? I'm here because the citizens of Harney County have asked me to come out and ask you folks to peacefully leave. And I, I think that you respect their wishes. And um, I want to help you guys get out of here. I'll get you a safe escort See, I'm out. Getting, I'm getting, we're getting ignored again, Sorry. Sheriff. Sheriff. I didn't come to argue. I just came to I'm not either. That's a peaceful resolution. Okay. So. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Yeah. Man, it's just so calm and, and peaceful. That exchange is indicative of what has generally been law enforcement's approach to this militia. The FBI, which has been erring on the side of caution, telling MSNBC there is no information regarding arrests of any of the protesters and could not confirm a claim by the sheriff that they would face federal charges. But in the midst of heightened national attention to issues involving police use of force in communities of color, this strategy of peaceful engagement with this group of armed white men has prompted questions for many who see a disparity in the law enforcement response. Why a wait and see approach to these protesters and an immediate militarized police response to Ferguson protesters in 2014? Why a more talk less action policy for men armed with real guns and what appears to be a shoot first ask questions later approach with people like John Crawford and 12 year old Tamir Rice? All valid questions as we seek ways to reduce the likelihood of an interaction with the police ending with a death because of the police. But as Slate's Jamel Bowie reminds us this week, the law enforcement reaction to Oregon's ranchers is rooted in its own very unique history of violence. He writes, it's also worth noting the extent to which the Rice shooting and many others are fundamentally different from that of a standoff between armed fanatics and federal law enforcement. It's not just that these are different organizations, local and city police versus the FBI and other federal agencies and different kinds of confrontations with different procedures, but also there's a different history involved. Confrontations at Ruby Ridge and in Waco, Texas ended with scores of dead white civilians and inspired the Oklahoma City bombing, the deadliest terror attack on American soil prior to September 11th, 2001. And it isn't the only different history involved. NPR reported earlier this week that Bundy said of the occupation that this was a fight about the Constitution and that the federal government has no right over these lands unless the states cede those rights to them. At the heart of this claim is an old tension around federalism that has existed since the earliest days of our nation over the sharing of powers between federal and state governments and its attention that the institution of slavery ultimately forced the country to confront and bloodily resolve as the Civil War forced a turning point in the history of American federalism. And although we emerged from the Civil War as a single nation, as we have seen just in the events of this past week, that tension between the division of state and federal powers was far from settled. It was there in the anti-government occupation in Oregon, and it was there this week when Alabama Chief Justice Roy Moore stood in opposition to the Supreme Court's ruling on same-sex marriage, and it was there in the responses to President Obama's executive action on guns, articulated most notably by House Speaker Paul Ryan, who said the president's proposals amount to, quote, a dangerous level of executive overreach.
Joining me now, Jean Theo Harris, distinguished professor of political science at Brooklyn College and author of The Rebellious Life of Mrs. Rosa Parks. Jonathan Metzl, director of the Center for Medicine, Health and Society at Vanderbilt University. And Vince Warren, executive director of the Center for Constitutional Rights. Vince, you said that the Second Amendment is there to protect militias. Well, here we have one. Is it, <laughs> is it doing a good job in its protection in Oregon? Is that how you would read what's happening here? Apparently it's doing a great job. <laughs> yeah. They're just having tea. Um, uh, here's, here's what's at, at stake here. The state's rights discussion that is, that's running through all of the pieces that we're having here has been historically deeply, deeply important. And from the civil rights perspective, the question is how do you get um, states who have decided their own created their own legal ecosystem to keep repression going forward. How do we move that to a federal level and al allow the federal government to create uh, federal standards below which states can't go to be able to keep civil rights people stay safe? The embedded in that is a tension, however, because when we see this in the militia, militia where a lot of people feel like, wow, the federal government can't really do anything with respect to the states. That's been the battle cry a lot of, of a lot of these militias. And it's a, it's, a, it's a legitimate constitutional tension, not necessarily in this particular right. scenario. There's, there's it's literally no scenario in which the federal government isn't allowed to create national parks. And I would just want to point out that if we were going to be talking about who's got the right to what, nobody's, there are no Native Americans in this story. Oh, but um, except that there are, <laughs> except that there are in that, uh, in that, uh, in fact, the party chairwoman, Charlotte Rodrigue, has said that the protesters have no claim to this land, that it belongs to Native peoples who continue to live there, and that the refuge is an important place, um, um, and that they have no sympathy for those who are trying to take the land from its rightful owners. So, so they, they have interjected here and I think in part this this is what is difficult for me Gene is on the one hand you know as a supporter of uh, of the kind of history of the civil rights movement I like a little occupation here and there right a little sort of push back against the government but this feels really quite different part of what I actually like about this is that the police chief ward that we just saw is modeling actually how we want the police exactly. to deal with protesters. Exactly. And I actually would like him to be a model for how then we deal with protesters, whether they're in Ferguson, whether they're in New York, yep. whether they're in parts of the Pacific Northwest, right? That Rather than calling for the violence of Ferguson on this command, on, on these protesters, Absolutely. to call for this reasonableness in relation to other to protesters. To understand these people have rights, to understand that a peaceful resolution is the paramount thing, right? And that that's what I think, when we see him shaking hands, what we want is for police all across the country with all sorts of communities in all sorts of protest situations to, to adopt that same uh, reasonableness to adopt that same respect for mm -hmm. the rights to adopt that same long view that what we want is for this you know for this to stay peaceful not to as you mm -hmm. said shoot first not to suspect first not to fan out and surveil first mm -hmm. so cool. I guess that's to me that's one of the interesting lessons if there's going to be a lesson this week from this. So if we like this model if we want to see more of that Jonathan why in Ferguson do we not get that I mean I I don't like to do the, oh, it's just race. Like, I mean, is it or is there something importantly different about what's happening here? Well, I think that obviously there's a very strong history of race that runs through this. I loved Jamil's piece, but I, but I would say that actually the history of race and firearms uh, makes mm. this very distinct. And so, for example, in the 1960s when uh, Robert Williams and Malcolm X and the Black Panthers wanted guns for self-reliance, mm -hmm. all of a sudden, oh gosh, we want we want gun control. Mm -hmm. Everybody rallies against that. So I think that there's a different iconography of um, black protesters having guns that it just elicits a different cultural anxiety than this particular issue. Now I think the two other big, two other issues I think that are at play here, um, getting back to Vince's point, is the question of the militia and the constitutionality, mm -hmm. particularly of the white militia, which I think is another important race point. According to the Southern Law Poverty Law Center, we've seen about a 50% rise in these kind of white militias over the last three or four years, particularly um, as people fear that their guns are going to be taken mm -hmm. away and also in the aftermath of some of the debates about the, uh, the Confederate flag. So there is, I think, more of this particular issue on the horizon and I think we need a broader policy. A central irony is if we did what the protesters uh, want, if the government did just go sell all that land, first of all, their grazing fees would go much higher. They mm -hmm. couldn't afford it anymore. And also, it's not like they're going to go buy, buy the land right. in a certain way. So if they privatize this land, which is what happened, I think that the the private sector would actually make this problem much worse for them. So I don't think that what they're advocating is necessarily the right situation. So, so, so let me let me dig in on that just a little bit. 
in part because you said there is a legitimate set of arguments, maybe not in this, but mm -hmm. around this tension between state authority and federal authority. And there are <laughs> there are Republican office holders and candidates for the Republican nomination for the presidency saying that we ought to have a constitutional convention to basically undo some of what the Civil War did in the sense of actually rebalancing the, the balance of powers back towards the states. Yeah, can I just tell you how much that really needs not to happen? At all? Yeah. Um, <laughs> Thank you. That really should not happen. Yeah. Uh, but just to getting to the, to the question of the tension, and I, there is a legitimate governing tension between whether this is really a, feder a federal mm -hmm. discussion or whether that, that this is a, a, a conglomeration of, of independent and sovereign states. Um, and that's always going to raise tensions, and those are good tensions to raise. Mm -hmm. And I agree with Gene that you protest, that is the way that you move these, these pieces right. forward. Um, the Constitutional Convention is a disaster because really what we're talking about here is that the states' rights argument that's picked up by the right wing, that's picked up by these re militias which are ni neither well regulated nor really focusing <laughs> on the federal government, that they do very much act like vi vigilantes in some ways, which frankly um, creates um, in black and brown communities a sense mm -hmm. that we should be pushing back against them. But the idea uh, overall is that um, these these communities that we're that we're pushing that the state rights argument is a is a shill for going back to the way that it was mm -hmm. where black yep. bodies and brown bodies and women were controlled it was much yep. better and easier that way and yep. even if the rest of the country doesn't want to do it that's how we do it here at home and yep. the only way you get there is through states rights. indeed that's what it sounded like to me um, when Alabama sort of stood in the proverbial schoolhouse door with judge Roy Moore this week I appreciate you um, with the nerd joke. Now for a fascinating story with a bit of a twist on guns, rights, and race. Let's go back to August 2015 to Ferguson, Missouri, one year after Michael Brown was fatally shot by Officer Darren Wilson. On the first anniversary of Brown's death, Ferguson was tense as both peaceful demonstrators and unrest unfolded. Is this into this tension came a group of heavily armed white civilians. Their presence triggered confusion, fear, and anger from many. Who were these men roaming the streets in body armor and holding semi-automatic weapons? Some thought they were plain clothes officers. Others pegged them as members of the Klan. Well, it turned out they are the Oath Keepers, a group of mostly current and former military, police, and first responders who profess to defend the Constitution, especially the Second Amendment. One of those Oath Keepers at the time was Sam Andrews, who that week led a team of partially made up of Oath Keepers to protect some of the local residents and businesses in Ferguson who felt vulnerable during the demonstrations. During this two-day mission, Andrews spoke to many Ferguson residents and learned that black protesters believed they could not openly carry firearms despite Missouri being an open carry state. They believed that if they openly carried guns the way Andrews did, they would be shot by police. So that motivated Andrews to organize a racially integrated open carry march during which black citizens would carry weapons with white oath keepers marching right beside them. The story is reported in depth and in detail in a piece posted this week on rollingstone.com. And he says his goal was putting firearms into the hands of black presidents as it was their right to bear them and to quote, have every black child in America see law-abiding black citizens carrying weapons and not being attacked by the police. According to Andrews, the Oath Keepers were resistant to these efforts, leading Andrews to withdraw from the organization and the Oath Keepers did not respond to multiple requests for comment. The march was held on a rainy day in November. Fewer than a dozen black marchers took part. But one of them was Paul Berry of St. Louis County. And his motivation for joining the march, he told us, was to combat the erosion of constitutional rights for African Americans who are in fear for their lives. The two men central to this story join me now. Paul Berry, a St. Louis County resident who's also considering running for office as a Republican, joins me here in the studio this morning. And also former Oath Keeper now, Sam Andrews, is joining us from St. Louis. Also, Wes Lowry, political reporter for the Washington Post. And there's Wes's chin. Hey, joining us <laughs> from yes. Washington. Hi, nice to see you. Sam, I actually want to start with you. I understand that you were a member of the Oath Keepers. You 
are now completely separated from the group as of August. But if you could go back to that time, can you tell me what, what was the motivation for initially coming to Ferguson? Well, originally we came to Ferguson to help the residents and protect them. There were people sleeping on the second floor of buildings above the small businesses, and there were also people hiding amongst the protesters trying to burn those people out of their apartments and burn the buildings down. Yeah, I know that you've said um, media have tended to portray that there were kind of protesters and police, and that you actually um, see, the, see there as having been four groups, not two. What are those four groups? Yeah, the lie is, is that there were two groups. The truth is there's four groups in Ferguson. There are criminals hiding amongst the protesters trying to burn buildings down and steal. And there are criminals wearing badges, some of them white shirts in management, that are hiding amongst a lot of lawful good policemen. And they're violating people's rights in a serial way. And it has to stop. So, Sam, stick with us. Don't go away. But, Paul, so I want to come to you because I think that's an interesting nuance that also goes to this whole sort of question around race. Why did you make a decision in that context to go ahead and be part of an interracial march that was open carry? Well, being in the open state of Missouri, it seems to me that there's an erosion of rights, not just with the Second Amendment, but all rights in this area. And if you have a constitution that affords a person gun rights, how is it that there's such a disparity uh, between Ferguson and the rest of Missouri? I think that that's a problem. Uh, you know, and I'm not for arming people. Open carry, concealed carry, no carry. That is the option that every citizen has. And I just, have, I just take issue with there being such a disparity just going five miles down the road. Right, so for you the issue isn't sort of whether or not you, there's an open carry. It's that whatever the rights are, everyone should be able to enjoy them equally. Exactly. And I think that you should be able to make, when we did yes. that march, it's very interesting. About a quarter of a mile from where we did the march, there was an individual that was actually uh, tried to rob somebody and person defend themselves with a gun. Mm -hmm. uh, what we, what uh, Sam and myself and the Rolling Stone article uh, sort of portrayed and understands is that African Americans are fearful of open caring. It's not about arming people. It's about the fact that you cannot, you don't have a right if you're fearful of utilizing it. And I just think that every citizen should have that right. So stick with me here, both of you guys. But Wes, I want to come to you as a reporter for a moment. Obviously, everyone knows that you spent a lot of time on the ground there um, in Ferguson. We did a lot of coverage, and yet this Rolling Stone piece had, you know, my producers and I were like, wait a minute, what? So, so tell me, was this kind of part of what people were talking about happening there? Is this a, like a piece that we missed? Certainly. I mean, there was some coverage, there was a little bit of coverage when the Oath Keepers first came. And, and again, what became always complicated with Ferguson was there was always such a whirlwind of action and information that a lot of kind of subplots got lost. Um, I remember when the militia groups first got there, not in 2015, uh, rather in 2014, as we awaited the grand jury decision, there were many groups, uh, the Oath Keepers included, who came in with this idea of guarding the, the buildings and the businesses. They, they took up shop on the, on the rooftops of many of the uh, buildings in Ferguson, Missouri with this understanding that, you know, they wanted to keep any looting from happening. This happened again in 2015 around the anniversary as well as during, as, as well as during the, um, as well as during uh, the anniversary uh, protests. And so we, we saw, we saw several militia groups at multiple times uh, that, that spent time in Ferguson, Missouri. In addition to this, I mean, and I do remember hearing about, I don't know that I was on the ground when it occurred, but I do remember hearing about this march and in the image you guys keep showing, um, there's, you know, one person who's out one of the black men who sticks out is Druba Shakur, who is a pretty prominent uh, local protester who's been very involved um, in organizing a lot of the civil disobedience in the end. And I remember hearing from him when this happened, and, and seeing his picture on Facebook saying, "You know, here I am, open carrying outside of Ferguson PD. We have these rights. We need to uh, uh, we need to exercise them." Uh, Sam, I, I could hear that you wanted to jump in. You, you want to yeah. get in on this? Well, there's been a lot of misinformation. We weren't there just to guard businesses. We actually put men, firemen, with buckets of water and a special forces guy armed right next to him with a fire extinguisher next to his feet to protect the people sleeping in the apartments. You know, there were human lives at stake. It wasn't like these businesses were abandoned because of the violence. There were actually human beings, women and children, and men 
of all races sleeping in the apartments on the second floor, and that's where we stationed our men. It wasn't to prevent looting. It had nothing to do with that. Right. So, it had so, to do so for with you, protecting there was a, human life. Right. So there, was a real, there was a real human component here as opposed to being just about businesses. Stick, stick with us. Don't go away. Jonathan, I want to let you in, in part because you brought up this question probably last hour when we were talking about sort of the difficulties of thinking about, well, what constitutes a right if everyone doesn't get to access it equally? Right. Well, I, I mean, again, I, I'm very sympathetic to the argument. And in fact, it, it does make sense that people who are actually being surveilled and having violence propagated against them, uh, those are the people actually, unlike many of the pro-gun protesters right now, these are the people who actually have a reason maybe to be armed. And so I, I do understand the impetus behind this. I think there are two very important things to keep in mind, though, that I think really trouble this and make us m maybe think critically of it. One is just the historical context, which of course, as we know, there's a long history of open carry being very racialized. It goes back to the writing of the Second Amendment and the passage of the Second Amendment and its own particular racial history in the 1960s when NAACP leader Robert Williams wrote a book, Negroes with Guns, about African-American self-reliance through, uh, through guns. He was basically, um, you know, surveilled by the FBI and it was a huge issue. So black people don't have the same right to open carry. We see this in the present day uh, with, with, you know, people picking up guns in Walmart. So the, number one is historical context. Point number two is just what guns do. Back to the first hour, guns protect us from strangers. That's certainly true. But again, most gun violence is everyday violence. Most gun violence is being shot by your domestic partners, mm -hmm. home suicides, issues like that. So I worry about just the spread of guns in that regard, because even though in particular context guns might, uh, might be useful, in a way what we'll see in that regard is a spread also of everyday shootings. And I think that's a point of concern. All right, everybody stick with us, because when we come back, I want to dig into this a little more deeply, because I also think in addition to the gun story, there's just an interesting story here about interracial movement building. Maybe we can learn something from it when we come back. We're back in our continuing conversation about an interracial open carry moment that occurred in Ferguson, Missouri. And Sam, I want to come back to you on this, in part because I'm interested in the idea that you actually learned something about the experience of African Americans in those early conversations that you were having, and that that's part of what moved you to action. Can you tell yes. us a little bit about that? Well, initially, some of the younger protesters came up to me and they said, what kind of gun are you carrying? And I told them that's the kind you should carry so people stop abusing your rights. And then I talked to some older educated guys that were Black Panther Party members. One man was a history teacher, brilliant guy, and uh, told him the same thing. He was afraid to open carry because he feared for his life. And then I spoke to this 65-year-old woman who wanted to carry a revolver to protect her and her family, but she was afraid to because she was afraid the police would kill her and I called this policeman over to explain to her that she had the right to open carry and he was more than willing to come over and tell her she had that right and when he walked over she had a fear-based reaction from his uniform and badge started sweating and shaking and her hands and legs were shaking and her mm -hmm. voice quivered and she literally was so afraid of that policeman that she couldn't even engage in conversation with mm -hmm. him. And it was at that point I realized we really have a problem here. All right, so, Paul, so talk to me about that then. Yeah. So, so Sam is, is saying something that I think is an experience many people have of not seeing the police as approachable, as friendly as, and, and it's in part driven by these experiences like Ferguson, or at least what Ferguson has come to represent, how would kind of an open carry movement if this had been bigger, if this had really happened, could it have made a difference? Well, I think that, you know, when you look at what the president's doing with his uh, uh, his gun bill, the biggest problem is we're not addressing the real issue. The real issue is that we have a country where there's some people that see African Americans and they're getting scared with a gun or without a gun. And look, if 10% of the people, African American, uh, open carried in Ferguson, would that help dispel whatever fears that we have? Um, I just believe that we have to get back to the constitutional basis and this idea that if you live in this jurisdiction, your rights aren't there and you live here. Uh, I just think we need to take this head on instead of cutting around. Uh, we have serious crime in Missouri. We are the number one per capita murder capital of the world year in and year out. We were in 2014. We will be in 2015. And until we address what's causing, it's not the gun. It's the person that's utilizing the gun. Where is that social ill coming? Is 
Is it because of poverty? Because mm -hmm. you go into rural Missouri, you have more guns per capita than you do in St. Louis. However, St. Louis is where the crimes occur. So, so Wes, let me let you in here. Um, because this is challenging for me, right? Uh, you know, on the one hand, I'm a, I'm a Southerner. Um, I grew up in, you know, in a household where my father always um, had guns, in part having grown up in the Jim Crow South, seeing gun ownership as being in part about racial self-protection. On the other hand, I keep thinking, I, I just, it's hard for me to imagine that more guns would make us feel safer. Well, it, it certainly, uh, you know, this idea of more guns in the hands of people who are seen as suspicious very often. Right. Um, you know, what we know, you know, research shows, we know this, and this isn't necessarily just a black-white thing. Even black people find other black people more suspicious because we've been trained right. and, and it's become socially ingrained, right? We, we know that black men specifically are seen as more suspicious, they're seen as older, uh, they're seen as more likely to be criminal, no, no matter who they are. And so, you know, it, it's hard to listen to this conversation and not think of, you know, example like Corey Jones, uh, you know, black man shot and killed in, uh, Palm Springs Gardens, uh, Florida last year, car breaks down, is on the side of the road, is waiting for a tow truck, and is legally carrying a weapon. And a mm -hmm. police officer right. pulls up on him and goes, oh, I saw a gun and got scared and shoots and kills him. This was a man who was legally holding a weapon for this exact type of situation. You're broken, out on the side, broken down on the side of the highway, and some guy you've never seen before, by the way, in an unmarked car, right. an un ununiformed officer pulls up. But again, what we know about the legal system is that a police officer, if a police officer has is afraid of his for his life they can shoot and kill you and the idea that having more guns in the hands of people who are seen as more suspicious by police officers it, it, it's hard to not imagine that leading potentially to more Corey Joneses so, so Sam this is so interesting to me in, in many ways there's a lot of agreement about yes. the definition of, of sort of what some of at least what some of the problems are here what do you see as a core solution to these inequities in how we can express our constitutional rights well as far as as far as the the guy that just commented um, he's not really getting to the heart of the issue the heart of the issue is is that the police have a violence problem within their culture and they have a code of silence problem that exacerbates that violence problem the the police are wholly incapable of rejecting the criminals that are wearing badges in their ranks and we're not holding police accountable and it doesn't matter if it's the Bundy Ranch where they're abusing a white rancher or if it's Tamir Rice where they're killing a 12 year old innocent little boy it doesn't matter it's all all government abuse and a complete total lack of accountability and if you believe the premise that 99 percent of the police do the right thing which I'll grant you that premise why is it so hard to prosecute the one percent who gets it wrong we need to be asking that question it's not about if you're open carrying or exercising a right it's about getting the police squared away and getting them to do proper threat assessments time distance and cover not violating those three fundamentals and not shooting our citizens uh, Sam, I, I hope that at some point you will actually um, have an opportunity to come to New York and join us at the table. I find this fascinating because we keep talking about this as a kind of ideological or even racial polarization, but so much of what I just heard you articulate is in certain ways precisely what I've heard sort of Black Lives Matter activists articulate, and yet it ends in these different ways. I am fascinated by this. I want to say thank you to Sam it's, Andrews. It's not. Oh, well, but yeah, but I want to say it's, it's not it's not racial. It's not racial. It's what it really is is a violence problem in our police culture, and it doesn't matter if it's a white mental yep. health patient in Albuquerque, New Mexico, who gets shot, or Tamir Rice. The police have a violence problem, and we need to hold people accountable. Sam Andrews, again, I hope that you will be able to join us here. I want to say thank you so much for joining us from St. Louis today. Also, thank you, thank you to Wes Lowry in Washington D.C. here in New York. Thank you to Jonathan Metzl and to Paul Berrigan. Thank you for this very complex story. Mm -hmm. And up next, the newest